Richard will start. A few folks are not here, but they will arrive. Um, as everyone here knows, digital security is a growing focus for the country, for the private sector, and for all of us, many who, of whom are here at the Wilson Center. Uh, we've been a target just like most of you have been targets of attacks, and we are trying to build a stronger, more secure workplace, uh, and we care a lot about what uh, Admiral Rogers does. Um, we have uh, also uh, incredible strengths in our board member, General Susan Helms, in Meg King, and some of the others sitting around this table. We've started something called our Digital Futures Project, which will have as a component uh, the cyber issue. Um, I like to call myself the godmother of American Homeland Security. That's a very modest title. Mm -hmm. um, but when the Department of Homeland Security was created uh, 12 years ago, I was there as a member of the United States Congress, the cyber issue was in its infancy. Uh, I marvel how, how far technology has come and how we can't even talk about protecting the homeland without talking about cyber. Uh, most of us were slow to the dance, even including Steve Clemens. Uh, U.S. Cyber Command wasn't stood up until 2009, eight years after 9-11. And uh, our guest, uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, is just the second person to lead it. Uh, he's hit the ground running, as all of you know, uh, as the nation's top cyber warrior and as director of the National Security Agency. Uh, he brings to both gigs uh, deep expertise in intelligence, cryptography, and cyber war. He's pushed for a smarter public debate. Watch, we're going to have one right now. And he's in a unique position to speak to the state of American digital security. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, Sec Secretary of Defense Ash Carter uh, will be speaking here on October 29th, and he rolled out the Pentagon's new cyber strategy at Stanford a University this spring. Tonight, here at the Wilson Center, Admiral Rogers, uh, at his request, will take us inside what this means for his command. It's a vision laid out in a new paper that he's unveiling. Uh, we were proud to host his predecessor, Keith Alexander, here, and we're thrilled uh, that Mike is here. He says he's been here before, but he's here now in this, uh, welcome, uh, in, in this uh, dual-hatted position that couldn't be more important. Uh, this conversation is on the record. David Wellna is right here on the record. Uh, and we're going to try to end promptly at 6 o'clock so that you can all join a reception with Admiral Rogers. Uh, reception runs from 6 to 7. He can stay until 6.30. I think I have that right. Yes, is that right? Yes, so please join me in welcoming Admiral Rogers, who will talk for a few minutes. I'll ask him a few questions, and then we'll call on you to ask your questions. So thank you all very much. You're very busy individuals. You have many things going on in your lives, but I thank you for taking some time to sit down and have a dialogue, because I'm interested in a dialogue, about the cyber challenges that face us as a nation, and specifically, what is United States Cyber Command's role in helping to address those challenges? Because if experience has taught me one thing in the cyber arena, it is that this is ultimately all about the power of partnerships, about how do you bring together a broad expanse of organizations with different expertise, different capabilities, different perspectives, whether they be in the government, outside the government, whether they wear a uniform, they're in civilian clothes, whether they be a contractor, whether they be in private industry, whether they be in critical segments within our economy, whether they be in the educational or the, the academic world or the corporate sector. How are we gonna bring this capability together in a coherent way to help us as a nation deal with a problem set that is only growing in its complexity? And you have but to read the newspaper or go to the net and grab whatever your particular source of insight is every day, and you will find story after story about the challenges facing us as a nation. I deal with that every day in my role as U.S. Cyber Command, one of our three primary missions, defending the Department of Defense networks. Literally every day, we are trying to fend off thousands of individuals, groups, nation states attempting to gain access to our networks. I I've had to deal with you know, major penetrations, as of many in the private sector. Um, I'm trying to create a learning, adaptive, innovative organization that is focused on how can we learn even as we're building the capabilities of the future. Um, because there is no one single organization, there's no one single technology that's gonna work our way out of this challenge set. Um, this is a long-term effort. In some ways, it mine's a little bit of the counterterrorism piece in that regard. But this is a long-term effort that will require a sustained focus at multiple levels if we're to work our way through this problem set. 
one of the primary reasons for today specifically was, as um, Representative Harmon has mentioned, in the spring and late April, the Secretary of Defense rolled out DOD's second cyber strategy. I wanted to wait a few months, both because I wanted the focus to be on that strategy, but also because, quite frankly, rolling into the fall, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to infuse the organizations that I am account accountable for with a sense of, so what is the commander's vision? What is our intent? What are the principles that are gonna drive us at US Cyber Command as we try to organize ourselves to create this capability and employ it in the defense of the nation? So we have tried to use today as a vehicle, among other things, to roll out this idea. So what is this vision? What is it that US Cyber Command is focused on and how is it gonna execute its three primary missions of defending the department's networks, of being prepared to respond to help defend the nation in um, response or for the potential for significant attacks of cyber in the cyber arena of significant consequence, and then finally, developing the range of capabilities that provide policymakers and operational commanders with a greater range of options for how we're gonna deal with all this. So that's really what brings me here today. It's why we asked many of you and we asked, um, you know, the, the Wilson organization, hey, would you be willing to take this on? Would you be willing to be part uh, of this conversation? Because clearly where we need to get to as a nation is not where we are right now. I don't think there's any of us around this table who would say to themselves, you know, I'm really satisfied with where the nation is. I think we're in a good place. I don't really think that there's a significant challenge here. I think all of us know that there's a lot of work. And I look forward to the questions. Um, Jane and I have a little interaction. And then I look forward to the questions and the insights that any of you care to share. Well, I thank you for that, Mike, and for candid comments. Uh, we're, having, we're going to have a candid debate here. Uh, and I trust that all of you are thinking of brilliant questions, which we will get to shortly. And the way we will do this is Meg will come up here because she can see to the end of the table. And those who want to ask questions will put their placards sideways and then we will call on you uh, so just just wait a few minutes uh, most of you have not not mixed, missed the fact um, uh, that my last employer was the United States Congress a very effective and efficient and bipartisan institution um, Congress has been talking about uh, passing cyber legislation for a long time and it has passed in several forms in each house um, but no law has emerged how important is it, Mike, to have federal legislation on, on the cyber issue? To me, it's critical. When I'm on the Hill and I am often asked, so Admiral, what, what can we do for you? And I say, really, there's two things, in executing your mission and ensuring that we have the resources and the capabilities that we need to generate, excuse me, the resources we need to generate those capabilities. But secondly, help create a legal framework that enables us to more rapidly share information both ways. And I always highlight to people, this has got to be both ways. I'm interested in the private sector sharing the insights that they see. I'm interested in our ability to push more information more rapidly to them. I'm interested in learning from my private sector teammates is what we predicted what you are seeing. Is the intelligence that we are generating to help you really of value? What could we do that would make it more effective? <coughs> We told you we thought you were gonna see X. Is that what you saw? When you found yourself you know, experiencing the effects of cyber activity directed against your networks, what worked? What didn't work? What did you find was effective? How can I replicate that capability, those actions that you took that were effective? How can we help to replicate them all across a much broader SWAT? I do not for one minute pretend that cyber information sharing legislation in and of itself is some sort of panacea that will solve every problem and every challenge we have in cyber. It is a beginning to, as I said, a much longer process, but it is an important beginning to me. Well, one of the issues, uh, and there are others, I'm sure Raj remembers them all up close and personal, is about the issue of giving immunity to the private sector if they share information, but, uh, and I don't, I'm not asking you to speak to that because I don't think that's exactly in your sweet spot. But the other issue is the private sector having doubts about uh, sharing it with the government. You know, we're the federal government, we're here to help you, is not resoundingly popular theme in the private sector. Um, is there something that you're, 
NSA or Cyber Command or somebody uh, could do to give more assurance to the private sector that this sharing environment would, number one, be protected and, number two, protect them? So part of the dialogue, first, the Department of Homeland Security is overall lead in the federal government as we work our way through this problem. And by so. the way, Michael Chertoff just arrived. There he is. Oh, hey, Michael. So we're just one, both as the Department of Defense, um, whether I do that DOD under my U.S. Cyber Command hat or under my National Security Agency hat, we are just one set of elements in a much broader partnership. And in that broader partnership that we're trying to create from the U.S. federal government to the private sector, with DHS really being in the lead for that, is to walk through as we work our way through this, so how are we going to protect your information? What is the information that would really be of value? Because one of the things, particularly if I put on my NSA hat, I'm quick to remind the private sector is I don't want personally identifiable information that creates significant challenges for me because under the legal framework that NSA must operate under, as soon as I encounter data on U.S. persons, I have to go to a whole different methodology about how I protect the data, how we restrict the data, who's allowed access to it. That is not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is what are the essential elements of information that for cybersecurity that we need to share with each other, not in names, addresses, personally identifiable information. That is not what I am interested in. And so one of the ways I think that's important in all this is a discussion about, well, just what sort of information are we interested in sharing? What's the formats that we want it in, both in terms of the private sector's ability to share with the government as well as the government's ability to share with the private sector in a way that's effective for them, not just what makes sense for us, but for them. Um, and I know there'll be some challenges as we work our way through it. But for me, as long as we focus on the mission of cyber defense, I'm pretty comfortable that we can get where we need to be. Okay. A um, couple other things. In Congress, part of the rhetoric from those who really want uh, a legislation is that uh, there could be a cyber 9-11 or a cyber Pearl Harbor. Um, is that rhetoric or is that a, a real idea uh, that we should worry about. I mean, what could that look like? And, you know, what keeps you up at night about a cyber attack? So I don't know if I use the phrase it's cyber Pearl Harbor because um, the image of Pearl Harbor to me is a bolt out of the blue, an attack that no one ever expected, and that the nation was caught totally defenseless. And I look at the environment around me and I think to myself, is anybody really surprised by the cyber activity we're seeing? And certainly I wouldn't characterize ourselves in the DOD or more broadly uh, across many other segments, both within the government and in the private sector, that we are somehow defenseless and it's just an early Sunday morning. So that's, for me, not the kind of analogy that I tend to, to focus on. Um, do I think, I, I tell you, the way I phrase it is, I expect that in my time as the commander of United States Cyber Command, U.S. Cyber Command will be called to execute its mission about responding to cyber incidents of significant consequence. I just believe it is only the when. It's not the if, it's the when this is gonna happen. Um, you know, part of the challenge, whether it's cyber legislation, whether it's the broader issues about how are we gonna work our way through this, at some point, well-meaning, well-intentioned individuals, collectively, all of us, we've got to generate action and not just talk. Because in the end, this is about a very real set of capabilities and circumstances out there that aren't something imaginary, um, that are very real. You've seen that in Sony. You've seen that in several incidences in the Gulf with Aramco and Razgas. Um, you've seen that in major penetrations of the U.S. government. You've seen that in major, right. major penetrations of the private sector. I mean, there isn't a segment in our society that hasn't had to deal with this. I don't care if you're an academic institution, you're a think tank, you're a large company, you're a bank, you're an element within the federal government, you're a tactical military organization. We are all dealing with this challenge. In terms of what keeps me up at night, um, you know, critical infrastructure is probably the thing that concerns me the most in terms of what do I think is potential impact um, as I've said publicly before, we have seen nation states spending a lot of time um, and a lot of efforts to gain access to the power structure within the United States, to other critical infrastructure, and you have to ask yourself why. It isn't just because I think they're idly curious. 
it's because in my mind, hey, they're doing this with purpose. They're doing this as a way to generate options and capabilities for themselves should they decide that they want to potentially um, do something, whether it's increase the pressure in the United States. And it's all very real. This is not just something that you read about as well five years from now. It's, a, it's in the realm of the potential. This is very real. And I watch this every day very closely. Just curious, has anyone here not been hacked? Raise your hand if you are the lucky person who has not been hacked in Washington, D.C. Unless you want to become the next target, just to show that. <laughs> How do you know? Well, I think most of us know if we've been hacked. And I mentioned at the outset, for those who came a, a tad late, that the Wilson Center, surely, and I'm sure other institutions here, uh, has been in the crosshairs. And we're well aware of it, and we're taking all kinds of precautions. But uh, whatever we prevent today could morph into something else tomorrow. And I know that's the evolving threat is another piece of this. Um, whatever capability they have now, if you block that, they'll develop a different right. capability. And I assume you're talking both about state actors and rogue actors right, and other, criminal elements, all kinds of folks out there. Right. The other thing that I, I should have mentioned in terms of when you think, well, what concerns you, the second big thing to me is what happens if or when um, terrorist organization groups suddenly decide that the web can be a weapon system and not just a vehicle mm -hmm. to recruit, to spread your ideology, to generate funds and revenue. Um, you know, that's something I pay attention to. It, it's something that I watch with, with great concern. That would probably be this, the, the second thing. And I'm not prioritizing one or two, but the two biggest things to me really are critical infrastructure in the U.S. and then the non-nation state actors. And don't forget the criminal piece in this. If you look at, at activity across the spectrum, I would still say that the greatest amount of activity of concern in the cyber arena is the criminal. Um, I'm not trying to minimize everything else. Uh, you know, it's a little less of concern to me as a Department of Defense individual. I am not a domestic-oriented individual. I am not a law enforcement entity. So my focus tends to be in the transnational and the groups outside. So then you're not the guy in the crosshairs in the lead story in the New York Times today about um, trying to get access to data uh, with respect to uh, tracking a, a, a conversation between criminals. I'm not going to ask you to talk about that, but when stuff like that is out there, uh, doesn't it affect the, the, the effort uh, to pitch uh, a, a public-private partnership? given the tension that's right. out there. It certainly is part of the dynamic. I mean, look, we have to be very honest for our, with ourselves. We find ourselves as a time in our society where we increasingly question authority and the role of government. I'm not saying it's good, and I'm saying it's, it's bad. I'm just saying it is. And as I constantly remind our team, you've got to step back and remember the context of the environment in which we operate. Always got to remember that. That's part of the challenge of working as a member of a government within a represent, representative democracy. It has stood us in great stead in the almost 240-year history that we've enjoyed as a nation. Um, and so part of the challenge for me, quite frankly, is at times, particularly if I put on my NSA hat, I'll have many people um, who will sometimes, from my perspective, confuse my foreign intelligence mission with my information assurance or computer network defense mission, which are totally different under different sets of authorities, and we use different processes and rules, but we have foundational privacy, pri we have foundational issues, though, that transcends both. Foundational to that is the rule of law. We always obey the rule of law. And secondly, the idea that as part of a, a member of our society, principles of privacy and the rights of individuals, which are enshrined in those laws, are something that you can't take for granted and we cannot attempt to override or pretend that they're not relevant to what we do. We have got to account for that, whether it's NSA or U.S. Cyber Command. If we can't engender trust in the nation we are serving, we are doomed to failure. Well, the public out there doesn't see things in neat little packages, which is part of the problem. Uh, but there surely is an ongoing debate about the scope and need for personal privacy. I think it's something we all value. But uh, without security, uh, there ain't going to be no personal privacy. So the goal, it seems to me, is to, is to set up a positive-sum game 
where we are protecting both. And I think that's doable, and it was Ben Franklin, uh, not even Woodrow Wilson. He lived before Woodrow Wilson, I thought I would point that out, uh, who said he that shall surrender, and she, uh, um, some, some uh, liberty for security deserves neither. I probably didn't get that exactly right, but you get the point. Uh, we, we need more of both. And let me just, just close with two, quest two short questions, um, and then we'll go to all your questions. Uh, the first one is about investments by other countries uh, in uh, cyber as a part of their military strategy. Let's pick China. We're not the only folks on the block thinking about cyber as a, as a part of our military strategy. Uh, how do we stay ahead of the curve if other nations are doing or trying to do what we're doing? Well, first, I would argue cyber is no different than any other from a military perspective. Cyber, in many ways, uh, has some of the same attributes we see in every one of the other operational domains. Most major nations of the world, if they have coastline, tend to have a navy, tend to have an army, tend to have an aviation or air force component to them. I believe that cyber will be foundational to the future, and you will see most nations putting some level of investment in. Um, the United States, we're no different. We've been very public as a department. We've been very public as a government about the investments we are making within the Department of Defense and in other areas of the government, both because we are concerned about how critical the defense of our networks are in the case of DOD to our ability to actually execute our missions, as well as the fact that we believe we need to generate a full spectrum of capabilities to give our policymakers and our operational commanders a greater range of options as they're trying to deal with challenges. But also mindful in all of that, that just as within every other domain within the military, the law of armed conflict, rules of engagement, broad frameworks for how we apply that capability exist, we need to get to the same place in the cyber arena. This is not a set of capabilities that we have developed just to be used indiscriminately. It will be a framework, but there'll be a basis for how we do it. And one, again, one of the reasons why I like dialogue with this is I believe in the long run we have got to get to foundational concepts of deterrence and norms of behavior. Just as I've experienced as a military individual in every other domain I've ever worked in my career, we've got to get there in cyber. Because right now I believe most nation states, groups, individuals have come to the conclusion that in the current framework there's little price to pay for the behaviors they are choosing to engage in. And in the long run, I don't think that's the best place for the United States to be, and I would argue more broadly, globally, I don't think that's in the best interest of the world. I, I look forward to the day when we have concepts of norms about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. We'll get there, but it'll probably take us longer. Well, than how, we I mean, I, I strongly agree with that. I bet most of us do, but what, what steps could we take now that would encourage an environment where there could be uh, some conversation about norms of behavior? So as a government, you've seen us start to have some dialogues in international forums about what we think some initial norms might look like. You have seen us within the DOD articulate a strategy, talk about what we're creating this capability for, how we would envision this being capability being, sets of capabilities being used. Again, because we're trying to communicate to the world around us, we are doing this for a reason that has a framework to it, and we want, quite frankly, we want you to understand that. If you looked at the first DOD cyber strategy, for example, you saw nothing about ideas like deterrence. You saw nothing about offensive capability. In this second um, iteration of the strategy, we intentionally tried to engender a broader dialogue about that because we want the world around us to know. So what capabilities are you developing? Why are you developing? How might you see them used? Again, all part of an effort to create a broader set of understanding out there. Last question. Um, I confess I am not a digital native. I am a digital adapter, sort of. Uh, you are, I'm sure, a digital adapter, really. Um, but I doubt you're a di digital native, just trying to figure out how old you are. Oh, yeah. Um, you are hiring digital natives. Their brains are wired differently. Their, their views of uh, uh, authority and hierarchy are different. How does the culture work, or does the culture work, or how, how are you going to make the culture work with a bunch of nerds uh, who know tons about this in a, in a military environment? 
So I will tell you, when I started my journey in cyber in the Department of Defense like 12 years ago, one of my foundational concerns was in this hierarchical bureaucratic structure we have within the department, are we going to be able to bring in a workforce that is adaptive to change, that's agile, and that comes from a very different background and perspective than those of us who have been doing this for a while? And I'll be honest, 12 years ago, my thought was, ooh, this is really going to be hard. I will tell you one of the most pleasant surprises I've run into in cyber is the fact that the foundational idea of service to something bigger than yourself resonates every bit as much today with young people as it did when I was that age. And I was thinking about what did I want to do with my life. So what I remind our leadership is mission is what motivates the men and women who have decided to be part of our team. That we have got to create a structure where everybody doesn't have to be out of the same cookie cutter. So we have civilians on the team, we have contractors on the team, we have uniforms on the team. I said, look, we want to do that in no small part because we want to appeal to a spectrum of capability. And particularly on the NSA side, if you walk out, you were at Fort Meade and you sat down with some of the amazing men and women who are doing this job every day, there are people with pigtails and flip-flops and shorts and tie-dye t-shirts, regardless of the temperature for the time of year, and I remind them, hey, look, it takes all of us working together. The, the thing that I remind everybody, though, that's foundational is mission, obeying the rule of law and remaining accountable to the citizens of the nation we defend, acknowledging that as humans, we are going to make mistakes. NSA and U.S. Cyber Command are amazing organizations powered by some really cutting-edge technology, but at their heart, they are enterprises driven by men and women. I remind people, even the most motivated, hardworking man or woman will sometimes make a mistake. So when you make a mistake, we're going to stand up and we're going to acknowledge we made a mistake. And then lastly, don't cut corners. When you cut corners, that's when you try to get yourself in trouble. Focus on the mission, focus on doing things the right way, be exactly where we need to be. It's kind of what I've tried to talk to the workforce in the 18 months in both jobs that I've been there. Well, I look forward to seeing you in flip-flops and a t-shirt, and I'm just guessing that's how you kind of hang out with some of that workforce. How terrific. All right, brilliant questions, one each. Uh, please, no speeches. Where's Meg? Meg, come here. <laughs> I see Jim first, and then Meg's. It, turn your cards sideways. So let's start in the with vertical. Jim, but then Meg, do it. Jim, you're up. Jim. What does sign mean? It's me? Yes, you. Admiral, I, hey, Jim. I really like you to. But I think we idea. should use mics because the, the acoustics here, so we just pass it around, are bad, and a lot of people far away want to hear you. Yeah. So talk into the mic. Don't just have it there. Got it. Okay. Admiral, I'd really like you to discuss the idea of the deterrence aspect of this. That, that really was new in the DOD strategy. Um, the devil is in the details. Uh, when, when you're talking about deterrence, you're actually talking about offensive capabilities. Um, how, does that, how does that fit? And I'm just wondering what lessons you've gotten from you know, 60 years of the Cold War and right. Cold War deterrence, and does that apply to this? To this uh, so I would argue there's also a defensive piece to deterrence. If you use, take the nuclear analogy, for example, experience has taught us there's two principles, not that there aren't others, but there's two principal ways to deter the nuclear experience teaches us anything. The first is to convince the opponent that despite their effort, best efforts, they won't succeed. They will fail. That's the defensive part. So it's one reason why in the department we're investing a lot of capability, why U.S. Cyber Command exists, to ensure that we are making it harder for the opponents to actually penetrate our, our networks to manipulate our data. The second and the one, the second idea of deterrence, and that's the one that generally gets the most attention, is you convince an opponent that even if they were to succeed in achieving the objective, the cost that they would pay far outweighs any value that would be generated, and therefore, it's in their best interest not to do it. That's one reason why multiple nations have had nuclear weapons for decades, and yet, at least within the nation state arena, most nations have come to the conclusion that the employment of the capability is, is not a winner. It's not gonna generate value, and the cost that you would pay for using them far exceeds any benefit. It's one of the reasons why in the strategy, we started talking about this idea about we felt that to help deter behaviors, we need to talk about the department's 
intent to generate a spectrum of capability from the defensive to the offensive. And that, that was foundational <laughs> to this idea of deterrence. Not because we're interested necessarily in constantly using it. We, we have nuclear weapons, but we don't wake up every day telling ourselves, boy, how are we going to use this capability today? We think to ourselves, how can this capability be employed in a way that helps to deter the action of others and help our nation achieve its desired strategic outcomes? Will it work against a non-state actor? I think that's the, the, the toughest challenge becomes, now how does that work against a, a non-nation state actor? Most nation states, while they certainly disagree, in general, in simplistic terms, I would suspect, history suggests they tend to believe that some form, some form of the current structure is in their best long-term inter long interest. They might want to gain an advantage, but in general, they don't want to do so if the cost of gaining that advantage is fundamentally destroying the, the broader structure. Non-nation uh, state actors, on the other hand, if you take ISIL as an example, if they had their way, they would destroy the very structure that we and many nations around the world are interested in perpetuating, this idea of freedom, of choice, <coughs> where the, the, the state doesn't have the universal veto over anything an individual wants to do. Clearly, that is not their vision of fu the future. I think that's a challenge that we're going to have to work our way through. I, off the top of my head, Jim, I don't have an easy answer for that one, although I do ask myself, look, every group, every individual values something. There's a way we can highlight that which you value potentially is threatened if you pursue these destabilizing courses of action. Perhaps that's a way to suggest this is not something that you want to do. Thanks for doing this. Catherine. Um, was the OPM breach as bad as Would you bad? use a microphone, please? Here, here. I have this okay. one. Catherine Herridge, Fox News. Was the OPM breach as bad as we were led to believe, and where are the discussions on retaliation? So I think you've seen a, a very public disclosure of what has happened over in the OPM network over time. Um, I'm, I'm not getting into the specifics of internal debate about what the U.S. government is or is not going to do, except to say, this is an ongoing topic of debate. Um, it's of significance. We all realize that. This is not some minor occurrence. Every one of us in the government in a position that's part of these discussions clearly understands that. I'm going to stick with what you've heard from. Some one question. You are not following Jane's rules. Damn it. Okay. It was then the saved chaos you, Mike. Began. I saved you. Uh, Richard Harknett. Mike. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Congresswoman Harmon. I, I just wanted to congratulate you first, uh, Admiral, on, on the vision. I, I think there's some really core fundamentals that you're getting to. Um, so let me just draw you out on one, if sure, that's sure. okay. Um, this notion that uh, we're dealing with an operational and strategic environment of constant contact with the enemy. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the operational implications of that. Uh, you talk later in the vision about retention and those types of things. But what, what does it mean to operate in a strategic environment of constant contact? So the, the way I phrase this to my fellow operational commanders is, are you prepared to operate and achieve your objectives in a world in which your ability to communicate and exercise command and control, again, speaking purely from a military perspective, is potentially, it's continually contested and potentially can be compromised. We've literally spent the last 20 years in the post-Soviet environment in which we within the DOD operated in a world in which our ability to communicate, our ability to share information, our ability and the confidence we had in the data that was visually presented to us was uncontested, was always very high. So one of the challenges for the future is what are you gonna do when you have to operate in a world where that isn't necessarily always the case? That changes a commander's mindset. It changes the way you prioritize. It changes the way you look at your networks. We traditionally, much like I would argue in the private sector, networks were something that were just tainted for granted. They're always there. They're never, I might have simple technical problems, but foundationally no one's gonna take the capability away from us and I can count on it being there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I don't think that's the environment we're moving into challenge, I believe, for an operational mindset is, so how do you work in that environment? How do you prioritize? How do you train? How do you create a set of capabilities that can still operate within that environment? 
that, that is not without challenge for us. Steve Clemens. Thanks so much, Admiral. Steve. You know, Jane Harmon has written somewhat critically recently of the U.S. government's uh, capabilities and response in the social media area when it came to ISIS. But when you go more deeply, when you think about the pipeline of people that you're trying to attract, I'm, I'm, what's brought to mind is David Ignatius' book, the novel, The Director, in which we weren't talking about flip-flops and tie-dye shirts, but, you know, full-body piercings and tattoos and just a very different culture of people. We got those, too. <laughs> But, but, but the point of it was people who didn't think about the boundaries and frames of norms and ethics that normally are part of our society. In fact, the bad guy in that, if I'm not, you know, f uh, spoiling Don't the end, spoil the plot is, for is, is, is someone <laughs> who came out upset. of that milieu. Yeah. When you have, when you see what's going on with ISIS, or you see the cultures and ecosystems that Russia is promulgating, or North Korea, or Iran, or China, where what they're willing to invest in is so far beyond the boundaries and rules and ethics you're willing and you say here today are important. It just seems that in the long run, your people are at a disadvantage when the other side has no rules. And I'm interested in how you deal with that tension. Well, I, my first comment would be that's not unique to cyber. You can find that across so many of the DOD mission sets where the framework and what we believe is acceptable, what we believe is reasonable, is very different from any of the, the nation states, groups, and individuals we have to deal with in the world around us. Um, it's a, I'm the first to acknowledge it's a challenge, but I re, what I remind people is the edge for us isn't our technology. It is the gray matter in the heart that drives our men and women. That's our edge, you guys. And when you look at that framework, I remain confident in our ability to deal with this fundamental challenge where we've got a world with people with a very different perspective and who are willing potentially to gauge in behaviors that for us would be totally unacceptable. The other thing as a leader I try to remind our team is if we have to compromise our, who we are in the name of our defense, they've won. They're going to turn us into something we're not. And I don't think that we have to do that to achieve security for our nation. Maybe another way to put that is ultimately uh, the goal is to win the argument, and we do that with our values, not with swords and computers and, and viruses and so forth. Um, next question is Patrick Tucker. Thanks. Um, uh, so thanks for doing this. Back in February, you had a tense and interesting exchange with Yahoo's uh, Chief Information Security Officer, uh, Alex Stamos, I was there. And uh, he asked you about end-to-end -end user encryption, and uh, uh, he very deliberately accused you of demanding that companies like Google and Yahoo and uh, Apple um, build defects into their products in the form of backdoors for the NSA. And uh, you said that there might be some way, some theoretical way, it's a, something that uh, Director Comey has also said at the FBI, to accommodate both the interests of law enforcement as well as the uh, interests of privacy advocates. So uh, one thing that a lot of people ask me about this year at DEF CON and Black Hat is, uh, is this. If encryption, end-to-end -end user encryption that is perfectly secure, that lives up to uh, what Bruce Shire would call, you know, the ideal of encryption, if it helps keep passwords secure, if it helps keep data secure, um, then doesn't it serve the cause of keeping networks secure? So the first comment I would make is encryption is in the best interest of our nation and in the best interest of security and the internet. I don't reject that premise for one minute. I firmly believe that. The challenge, I think, for us as a nation <laughs> is how do we find this balance where technologies that are being developed and the legal framework that we use as a society to address law enforcement, national security issues, how do we create a framework that enables us to account for that technical change in a way that engenders confidence in our citizens? The, the conversation with Alex, from my perspective, was more about a contention, well, it's not technically possible. And I said, it is technically possible. Now, there's a broader policy and there's a broader discussion we need as a society about are we comfortable with that? Um, and I'm not, you won't hear me argue that's the only option out there. In the end, we've got to sit down as a nation and have a conversation about what are we comfortable with? 
what's the best way to address these two very valid concerns? How do I engender the privacy and rights of the communications of our citizens, most of which are incredibly lawful? Every one of us around this room engaged, I do. I use those same systems to talk to my children where they are, to talk to my wife, to talk to my family, my friends. At the same time, how do we deal with the fact that there are criminals, there are nation states, there are groups out there who want to do harm to our nation and to some of their fellow citizens and use that as a vehicle to coordinate, plan, and execute those activities? And I last comment I would make is it's it's reflective of this of the dynamic we find in society right now where I'm a little perplexed as to why it is good versus bad. Yeah. This ought to be an important conversation for us as a nation about what makes the most sense for us. And it's all too often I watch people who try to paint this as, well, if you're for one perspective, you're in, in terribly bad. You just want to violate privacy. And if you're on the other perspective, you're just inherently good. And I just don't see it as black and white like that. Just, just to add to that for a second, I mean, the word balance, I think, is, is, is maybe the wrong word. Uh, we need security and we need liberty. Uh, two imperatives. Additive. Like it, it, balance implies a zero-sum game. And if this is a zero-sum game, we lose. Uh, I think that's part of what you're saying, Mike. Right. I just to me, want to ask two, you. There's two imperatives. If that's what you mean. we got to meet both of and these imperatives. Le let me get around the room, and then we'll come back. I know Catherine has Patrick, a second question, you, and Patrick, you do much. too. I just want to be fair to everybody else. So Damien Paletta is next. Thank you, Admiral. Hey, Damien. Um, you know, you guys at Cyber Command have probably some of the most amazing computers in the world none of us will ever know about, but, and you work on some of the most... Um, cutting edge technology, but then we hear that the joint staff has to take down their email system because of a spear phishing attack. And you know, one of you mentioned one of your missions is to protect the defense networks. Spear phishing seems very 1990s in terms of um, a way to infect malware. Can you talk about the challenge of educating and training the Pentagon staff about simple things like that, and also, is that something that you guys just have to live with, that spear phishing is going to find its way, it's going to continue to seep through, even at the highest levels of the Pentagon? So the first comment I would make is, it's a good reminder to all of us, and I have this dialogue in the department all the time, you have, could have the greatest technology and the greatest defensive structure, but in the end, never underestimate the impact of user behavior on a defensive strategy. So if you look at that <laughs> penetration, which we have publicly acknowledged, that campaign went against dozens of networks, segments of the network within our department. They were able to achieve that level of penetration in one. Um, and I, when I say that level of penetration, we were able to keep working. I, I quickly developed some work. I'm not gonna talk publicly about the TTPs we use, but I was able to develop an immediate set of workarounds. It's not quite as simplistic as, as it is painted. Um, that's in part because in honesty, I'm not interested in highlighting to those listening as to exactly what we do and how we do it as we deal with challenges. But as I said previously, I remind people, look, we have got to get used to this idea about how are you gonna deal in an environment in which despite your best in interests or efforts, you are going to be penetrated. I remind both the department and more broadly, every organization I deal with in the private and the public sector, it is not a question of if you're gonna be penetrated, it is a question of how and when. So you must, and that's one of the biggest changes to me that I would say in the last decade I have observed. If you go back a few years ago, I and, and much of my fellow cyber warriors very much focused on this idea of spend a lot of your time on the perimeter st stopping trying to get people out. What I have come to believe is you not only do that, got to do that, but you got to spend time thinking about, so what are you going to do when they get in? How are you going to keep operating? How are you going to ensure that your critical terrain, your critical functions continue to be executed, which is what we did on the joint staff? Um, again, I don't publicly talk about the how we did it. But. Bob Dickey. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Hi there, Mike. Good to see you. Uh, when you were speaking about the uh, way the bad guys, if you will, uh, when they develop a, a success, and we develop a defense to that, then develop another, then they develop another uh, step that then we have to defend against. Uh, it clicked to me that's much like the bacteria that are getting smarter. 
you know, the biotech companies <coughs> develop an, uh, an antibacterial medicine that works, and the bugs get smarter. And it's, it's an ongoing game. Uh, has anybody talked to or uh, other industries like the like, like, like Big Farm or or the like that are also have got to cope with ways with the the, uh, the uh, they've got to cope with second and third and fourth right. generations? There's a lot of people who use the analogy that cyber defense is a little bit like. <coughs> the human defensive system in the sense that our, our immune systems are premised on the idea that despite our best in efforts, we are going to receive viruses and bacteria and that the body then is designed in part to, even as it's ingesting it, how it defeats it. Um, our, our, def our immune systems aren't based on this idea of you never get sick. In many instances, hey, you got to sick to get, to get better. How do you make sure you never get chicken pox? Again, you get infected one time, your body develops a tolerance, and then it doesn't happen. Um, and I'd be the first to admit, the, the changes in TTPs, if you take the last um, issue that Damien had talked about, the same actor tried almost the exact same thing a week before. Uh, we totally forestalled it. Within a week, I watched them totally change the, the structure that they used. It came at same actor literally in a week came back with a totally different scheme of maneuver that I had not seen before. Um, it's just as I remind the team, look, every day, this is a game where, this is not a game, every day we are in contact with a series of adversaries that want to penetrate the network, gain more insight, steal data, potentially manipulate data. We are up against an adaptive set of adversaries here who are constantly changing. So we have to be innovative and agile if we're going to keep up with that, and we got to acknowledge that we're not going to be perfect. So part of our strategy has got to be, so what are we going to do to keep going despite our best efforts if someone gets in? We have about five minutes more, so Catherine and, pa and Patrick, my apologies. You no can problem. talk to yeah. Mike at the reception, but next question is from Graham Allison, all the way down there. <laughs> Hi, Graham. Use a microphone. Thank thanks very much, and thanks for making such a coherent presentation. It's hard for me in the deterrence conversation to understand what's the state of the conversation. And you mentioned as an example uh, the penetration of OPM as a big event. Uh, Mike Hayden has said about that, he would have done that in a second if he had could, for, if, to take the equivalent Chinese files. So I presume we would. So help me understand what is it that somebody did that we would, didn't do or wouldn't do, and what means deterrence in that context? So among the, uh, one of the questions we're trying to work through from a policy perspective is, so for example, what is the trigger that elicits a response? Is it impact as defined by some dollar value? Is it impact as defined by the idea of value? One of the issues in the aftermath of Sony, for example, was this was an attack directed against arguably the freedom of expression, one of the fundamental rights for us as a nation. Hey, on that basis, does that trigger a response? Is it importance to the nation and its ability to operate? Is the criteria you want to use some dollar value? Is the criteria you want to use some level of loss of life, harm, injury? So OPM is just one part of a broader dialogue for us, you know, on the policy sector segment as we work our way through this. So what is it that triggers certain policy responses and how do we communicate broadly to the world around us just what those expectations are as a way to try to shape the behavior and the choices of others? Clearly, we're in the very early stage of this, of this and we are still working our way through it. I don't pretend that that's not the case for one minute. And it is not a one-size-fits-all. So what we elected to do in the aftermath of the Sony attack is not what we elected to do in the aftermath of the OPM incident. And in the aftermath of Sony, remember, the president talked about we will respond at the time and place of our choosing. I think that's an important component of, of this. You don't always want to telegraph to the other side exactly what you're going to do. Last three questions will be Christy, Rich, and Alyssa. Christy. Yeah. Um, as you know, since Use a mic, please. She's ruthlessly efficient, Christy. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Since 9-11, as you know, there's been an enormous expansion of the national security state and institutions, enormous funding going into intelligence. There's no longer just NSA headquarters. There's NSA Utah. There's NSA Georgia, uh, along with maybe uh, many other institutions. I just wonder if, if you and the intelligence community envision shrinking of this vast, enormous bureaucracy, or is it going to continue to grow, stay at a steady state? Um, uh, that's what I'd like to know. So the first comment I would make, let's take some of the examples you quoted. We've had a presence in Utah since 1990. It's not a 9-11 phenomenon. Uh, we went there, for example, because of the great access to languages that are available in Utah. Um, if you look at the, for NSA, our all, other largest concentrations are all, they all predate by almost a decade the 9-11 events. They're reflective of a much broader sense that the world around us from a technical standpoint is changing and we need to realign with it. In terms of resources, the intel community has been in declining budgets since 2012. You're about to start 12, 13, 14, 15. We're about to start in 16, a 50 year of declining resources. I just um, and working on the 17 budget, so the 16 budget is before Congress. We'll see what comes out of there. Um, we're starting the planning right now for the 17 budget. I'm quite frankly trying to figure out how I'm going to take the cuts we have to deal with. Well, I mean, those you, who, you, would, uh, who would, if I could finish my, so, let me yeah. finish, please. So for those who would postulate that the intelligence community has been on some never-ending resource growth that hasn't been the case during my time, they've been declining since 2012. And I'm not arguing that's good or bad. Hey, as a nation, our priorities shift. I certainly understand that. And, and I assume, just because we do have to get to the last two questions, that uh, prior to 2012, I'll tell you, the budgets did increase. Uh, and then along came something called sequestration. Um, Rich. Uh, yes, thank you. So, Admiral, the, I would say that one of the nation's greatest strengths is our university system and our academy. And during the Cold War, we were very effective at uh, using that to help understand deterrence policy issues with nuclear weapons. So I guess my, my question is, as a nation, what could we be doing right now? What could the academy do, or, or what should we be doing with the academy to help address some of these issues? So let me talk about service schedule, and then I'll talk about more broadly the educational segment. So for service academies and within the DOD broader educational structure, what I say is, hey, look, I need your help in training and educating the cyber workforce of the future for the department. Because there is both a training component which teaches you how and what you're going to do and an educational component that helps you understand the why and the broader framework. Within the broader academic world, um, I spend a lot of time at universities around the United States. Within the last week, I was just out, coincidentally, Christy, in Utah, and spent time with five different academic <laughs> organizations. Because I was interested in what can we do in this case. I said, you have great language expertise, computer science, data center engineering. What are some of the things that we can take advantage of? The other point I try to make to major universities is go back to our experience in the early days of the nuclear arena. The foundational concepts of deterrence that we take for granted today, they weren't there in the 40s and in the early 50s. We created those. And one of the biggest engines for the creation of those concepts was academic research. I mean, everybody thinks, for example, about Henry Kissinger now as National Security Advisor of the Secretary of State. Go back to his earliest days when at Harvard he was writing papers, books, periodicals on this idea of nuclear deterrence. Um, you look at some of the foundational work that RAND and other organizations have done. What I try to tell the academic sector is help us think through the really tough challenges. That's where you are really uniquely positioned in my mind, in a way that I quite frankly am not. Hey, my focus is on the day-to-day, -day, how do I help defend the department's networks, how do I achieve our vision, how do I execute the mission set the department has given us? I don't get to spend as much time as I would like, Ed, about the broader range. That's where the academic world, I think, really can play a big role. Alyssa. Take us home, young lady. <laughs> um, 
What was Cyber Command's role in responding to the OPM breach? Uh, it's been said on Capitol Hill, U.S. officials said it began in November 2013. Um, why wasn't Cyber Command, with the help of other agencies, able to repel it? So, U.S. Cyber Command is responsible for the defense of the Department of Defense's networks. It is not responsible for the defense of the .gov domain or .com, .edu, anything else. So the first comment I remind people is, remember, that's not our mission. Second issue is, as OPM, as we started more broadly to realize the implications of OPM, um, to be quite honest, we were starting to work with OPM about how can we apply DOD capability if that is what you require. Um, in the end, we were able to do it with um, some other help. If I put on my NSA hat, quite frankly, NSA, we deployed a significant amount of people and expertise to OPM to try to help them identify what had happened, how it happened, how you should structure the network for the future. So in that role, we had a big you know, par partnering with others. I don't pretend for one minute it was just NSA, you know, DHS, FBI. We've become a pretty tight team over time. Well, Mike, I'd like to come back to your answer to Christy and Rich about the academy, but also let's add think tanks, let's even add print magazines and, and radio and television and everything else, uh, which are, okay, but they still, but trees are still used. Uh, but my point is that there is a huge role uh, uh, for uh, helping solve what is a communal problem. We're all potential victims. Most of us have been victims here. And it is essential that we put the country first. And in listening carefully to you, uh, number one, uh, I'm honored that uh, we're having this conversation at the Wilson Center. Uh, it's exactly the kind of conversation we value here. Number two, uh, uh, you seem r right on your game and focused on evolving threats and the series of tools and ways to deal with them. And number three, um, we're all going to become your best friends because you need friends, and we're it. And that's why a reception starts right now. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Please accept my He was great. Occasionally I would just, oh my god, I'm tapping this thing. Oh, they got another, okay. Oh, no, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you're right for my face.